and welcome to this session. I'm Walter Minute. I am a software developer toward XIG in Switzerland. And in this session, I'm going to talk about uh, how uh, we use containers uh, on IoT devices and also how, how we are trying or managing to convince old school embedded developers uh, that containers can be used to run uh, application on this kind of, of devices. So uh, the idea uh, is to take a device that it's it's more or less powerful than a server or a PC, but still use Docker uh, to run uh, a containerized application uh, on it. So uh, let's start by defining what we mean with small. Um, of course, uh, we mean small compared to a server uh, or your development machine probably, uh, but still uh, a device capable to run an high-end operating system like Linux. Uh, so if we want to use popular devices as terms of comparison, uh, we are talking about a Raspberry Pi, but we are not talking about an Arduino, because of course on an Arduino you cannot run a Linux or any kind of uh, full-featured uh, operating system. So uh, how my experience uh, with containers started? Um, it was uh, in a typical coffee machine chat with Brandon, our uh, current CTO. At that time, uh, Brandon was working on innovation and he started mentioning containers uh, as a way to run uh, application on our devices. And I say, okay, well, what are you saying? I mean, uh, this kind of things is for the cloud and for servers. Um, but at the end, he managed to convince me to learn uh, something more about that and maybe do some experiments. And I mean, starting thinking about it, at the end, we're running Linux that it's coming from Unix that was designed for mainframes. So maybe this kind of technology can also be uh, adapted to uh, an embedded or IoT uh, scenario. And I think uh, at that time uh, I had uh, some uh, ideas about containers that were kind of wrong, kind of myths. Uh, first of all, I was kind of associating containers with virtual machines. Uh, I understand that they can um, probably fit similar scenarios, they can solve similar problems in some contexts, but at the technical level, at the implementation level, th those are very different things. We don't have hardware virtualization around in containers, at least if we run them uh, on Linux. Uh, also the idea that containers are very big, very resource intensive, um, and also uh, some misconception about how complex it could be to build a container or run it or adapt my uh, application to run uh, in such in such an environment so uh, traditionally uh, in embedded development uh, the idea is to have a tight integration between the operating system and the applications um, so uh, you have different tools like Yocto or Open Embedded, build root btxdis that allow you to build uh, an a system image. The system, system image integrates very heavily uh, all the components of the OS and all the libraries and things you need for your application and the application itself. At the end, you have a full customized system that is deeply optimized for your specific hardware and user scenario. But this also has some downsides. Uh, of course, first of all, learning the tooling involved into building such a complex thing, it's complex by itself. Uh, all those tools have a quite steep learning curve and it takes quite some time before you really master all the details uh, of the complex build systems and, and all these kind of things. Um, this also reflects into maintenance costs because, uh, of course, you need skilled people to take care of this. And every time you change something, it can be even a minor patch. Uh, it can have a kind of chain effect on everything else in your system and you end up with a major upgrade, maybe. Um, this leads to slow and big releases because you release everything at the same time and also means that many times people need to focus on the operating system and not on the application and i think this is an issue because it's the application it's what you use to provide value uh, in your in your embedded device uh, people are not going to buy uh, your system because it has a very efficient uh, image or because it's running uh, the latest version of the kernel they are buying it because your software, it's providing all the features they expect from, from this kind of devices. Okay, but 
there is an alternative. I mean, on PCs or servers, we don't build the OS, we just run a standard distribution. Uh, why you're not doing this? Um, this is done on some devices, but the main issue is that those distributions, at least the most popular ones like Debian and so on, are really not designed to run on an embedded device. Uh, so they are designed for kind of server or desktop environments. Um, they are usually relatively big. Um, and also an issue we have on embedded is that hardware is not standardized. It's not like running on a PC where most of the hardware interfaces and the, let's say, low level behavior of the system is standardized. Every device uh, has different storage, different kind of um, external devices and so on uh, and doing this kind of heavy customization on top of the standard distribution is not easy at the end you end up uh, with the previous situation and even if you manage to run uh, a standard distribution uh, you probably need to still cross compile your software because you're not yeah, using the same architecture of your pc and even if you're using the same architecture maybe you're not using the same version so containers can be the egg of Columbus, meaning a simple solution to a quite complex problem. Uh, we can have uh, still a small uh, and efficient and very well um, adapted to the hardware system. And this system is then able to run containers. And so uh, to develop our application, we can use high-end framework and all the kind of goodies uh, you are used to, uh, to use as a high-end developer. Uh, we can mix the lowland OS, embedded OS, and uh, the container platform uh, to run the applications. But of course, this is also not coming without challenges. Um, we are still talking about devices with limited resources. Uh, so we measure memory and storage, maybe in megabytes, not in gigabytes or terabytes. Um, we probably need to adapt our solution to this context. Um, we will probably also need to accept some hardware. The power of IoT and embedded devices is coming from the integration between hardware and software. Uh, so your uh, software is going to need some sensor to acquire data from the environment or actuators to perform some operation on the external environment to uh, implement its, its function. Uh, and this is usually something we don't do from a container. Um, and as an embedded developer, uh, I've been being used to this kind of heavy integration of all the different components. Uh, moving to the container model probably also requires a bit of a change of mindset, uh, thinking about uh, more about the system rather than a single monolithic thing. And this also changes the way you can design uh, your solution and, and your software at the end. Um, to show how this can be uh, implemented on a embedded device uh, i created a small demo it's called broccoli nader uh, of course it's not a real device and developing a real device uh, takes months or years of development from a development team uh, that could, it was just a quick demo uh, but the idea is to show uh, some of the challenges you may face when developing a real uh, embedded system iot system uh, for production and the broccoli nader the idea is to have this um, machine that allow you to put some vegetables on a scale uh, to weigh them and then the system is going to recognize which kind of vegetable uh, you put on the scale um, collect the weight and information and being able to for example print the label uh, to put it sale or something like this so uh, even such a simple scenario we have quite some challenges uh, we need to access the hardware because we need to get the weight from our scale. We may use uh, machine learning and vision to recognize uh, different kinds of vegetables. Uh, we probably need to provide a local user interface. You're not going to access these devices to a browser uh, usually. So we need a screen and something like this. Uh, but we still may provide a new UI to a browser uh, to show some kind of aggregated data. For example, how many broccoli or whatever kind of vegetable we weighted during the day and what's the average weight or something like that so uh, just let's see the demo in action so then we can look under the hood and understand how it was implemented okay here we have a scale uh, the scale uses a load cell the load cell 
changes its resistance depending on the weight and we have a converter that translates these analog values into digital data we can read from some IO pins. Um, we also have some additional very simple hardware, uh, just a push button to start the operation, a couple of LEDs to check how it's going. Um, we have a off-the-shelf network camera uh, that we use to capture images and read them over TCP and feed them to our uh, local UI and all the machine learning and so on. Let's try our device. So let's put some vegetables on the scale and as soon as we push the button, it should recognize it and provide information about the weight. Let me see. But yeah, we named this demo broccoli nether. So probably we should try it also with some broccoli. Let's carefully put them on the scale and let's weigh them. And here you see uh, information on the local UI. Uh, of course, information is also stored into the InfluxDB database that then is used to populate the uh, chronograph dashboards. So here we can see average weight of our vegetables and so on. So now, now let's look at how this has been implemented on the software side. Here in this diagram you can see the architecture of our broccolinator. Um, you can see in green uh, something I developed from, from scratch or reusing uh, at least some runtimes uh, and um, the other blocks are component I just used as they are and this is definitely one of the advantages of using containers you can take an existing let's say piece of software and run it as it is on your system to provide some specific services uh, let's start from this from the top uh, we have uh, this software of course it's been uh, implemented using uh, native code uh, it's just C++ it's quite simple um, on top of this, we have the business logic. It's implemented in C Sharp using .NET, because why not? Uh, and uh, it's using different kind of uh, communication sockets and HTTP requests or existing APIs to communicate with all the other components to kind of orchestrate, orchestrate the behavior of the system. Uh, one of the components is the image recognition part. Uh, this is implemented in Python and using uh, TensorFlow Lite. It's basically the TensorFlow sample um, and it's providing a REST API over HTTP so you can provide an image and get back uh, recognition results. So it's like 75% broccoli. Okay, let's do it. Um, then we have a local user interface. Uh, so kind of a traditional UI for an embedded system uh, using a touchscreen. Uh, this is implemented using the Qt library. Um, libraries, so that's C and C++ code. Qt is quite a popular solution for this kind of um, application embedded. Uh, and then we have uh, the components we took exactly as they are. Um, since we need to store some data and those data are time related, we use a time series database and InfluxDB is quite a popular uh, solution for this. Uh, and on top of this, to uh, get aggregated data, dashboards and so on, we use chronograph that it's a solution coming from the same company is quite well uh, integrated with InfluxDB. Uh, let's see the different uh, kind of challenges uh, we face during development. Uh, first of all, we need to access the hardware. Um, the good news is that on uh, any uh, Linux and Unix system, uh, the uh, idea is that everything is a file. And so by sharing the right things inside the container, uh, we can access uh, our hardware. Uh, the container usually is a kind of sandbox uh, where you are isolated from the underlying uh, hardware or at least from the low level details about that. Um, but by sharing uh, devices, there is a device command line option in Docker, uh, or by mapping the right folders, uh, you can at the end access your devices. Um, you still need to um, ensure that your uh, user and group IDs inside the container matches those that are expected to access this kind of hardware on the underlying OS. This can be a matter of configuration of your system. Uh, and you may also need to provide some additional capabilities and privileges uh, to the container to perform some specific operations. Uh, but we managed to do everything without having to run at full minus minus, let's say, privilege level. Uh, we just need to adjust some uh, some details. If you want to implement a graphical user interface running from a container, 
uh, we have different solution. We can use Axidamine, we can use Wayland. Wayland is definitely, let's say, more modern uh, solution. It's used by many embedded systems nowadays. Um, but both uh, basically just need to share a socket uh, to have the client application communicate with the server or compositor, depending on the platform you use. Um, in Wayland, you can also share memory, so it's definitely more efficient when rendering video or kind of uh, high performance graphic uh, on the screen. Of course, your server or game compositor uh, may need to run with some additional privilege. Uh, it also needs to access input devices like mouse, keyboard, touchscreen. Uh, it may need to detect devices at runtime if you plug in uh, like a new controller or something like this. Um, and an important topic is accessing the GPU uh, because if you want to accelerate your uh, UI, graphical UI using a GPU, uh, you need to access it both from the compositor and from the client uh, because um, GPU implementation is mostly in user mode. Uh, so this gets, let's say, into your container. Uh, details of how you can do this, which kind of devices you need to share, change depending on the uh, hardware architecture you are using. Uh, but usually it's really just a matter of figuring out which devices you need to share in the compositor and in the client and which privileges you need to, to enable. We are still running uh, on a hardware architecture that is different from the one we are using for development. So uh, if you are talking about native code, uh, we need to cross compile it. Um, we use emulation when building our containers and whether we use it explicitly or we use uh, like features like buildx or specifies, specifying minus minus platform uh, on the comma line. Um, using emulation, it's, it's good if you need to perform some, let's say, not computationally heavy operations like downloading packages, uh, installing them, changing configuration file. That is uh, what you mostly do inside your Docker file. Uh, but if you need to build uh, like 100,000 lines of, lines of code, uh, probably doing this through emulation can be uh, 10 or even 100 times slower than doing it natively on your machine. So uh, here makes sense to spend some time and effort in building a cross-compiling tool chain. If you want some advice from me, uh, if you can use Debian, that would be great uh, because in Debian you have a very, very good support for multi-architecture. So you can install uh, software components from a different architecture on your machine. And this can be leveraged uh, using also the cross compilers they provide uh, to easily install all the libraries you need to develop your application, even if it's for a different architecture. Um, if we want to run existing containers, and we probably want to do it to have services like database or web server or something like this, um, that's definitely a good solution. Uh, we need to be careful about some details. Uh, not all those um, components can be provided for the specific architecture we are needing. So uh, if the software is not open source, we cannot even rebuild it. So this is something you need to take in account when you are designing your system. But luckily, uh, most popular distribution uh, at least support ARM32 and ARM64 that are probably the most, po uh, most popular platform um, on embedded. If you are running on x86 or x64, probably that's even less of an issue. So uh, I hope that this session uh, make you uh, curious about this idea and maybe willing to experiment. How can you do this? Um, so this is a bit of self-promotion. Uh, if you want to try on our hardware, uh, you can use Torizon, is the project I'm working on. Uh, it's really designed to provide a small embedded OS to run containers. Uh, you can find all the information on our website. I have a link at the end of the presentation. Uh, but you can also take just a Raspberry Pi uh, with the standard Raspbian distribution. Uh, it's quite easy to install Docker on it, so you can uh, also experiment in this way. Um, and there are uh, also other open source or commercial solutions out there that really leverage this idea of running containers on, on an embedded device. Uh, Fedora IoT from Red Hat, Azure IoT uh, from Microsoft, uh, Azure IoT Edge, sorry, uh, or uh, Balena that provides a solution to run and also update application on embedded devices. So after this discussion, uh, containers are going to be 
uh, the only way to develop software on embedded devices? I don't think so. Um, I mean, uh, as running a full-blown OS like Linux didn't fully replace writing your own firmware, uh, I think also containers are not going to fully replace um, the fully integrated approach I described at the beginning of the presentation. Um, the, you may have good reason to do this. Uh, first of all, maybe optimize your hardware cost by reducing the requirements um, and so on. Or you need something that is really tightly integrated. Um, on the other side, the ease of development uh, of using containers probably makes sense when you have a small development team, you don't have too much time uh, to invest into learning and maintaining a complex solution. So I think um, containers will they build their own niche, it can be large or small, inside the embedded development scenario. Um, but the main point is, if you are thinking about developing and designing an IoT system in 2021, definitely you need to consider also container as a solution. Uh, we have some time for Q&A in the chat. Um, here we have some resources. Um, that you may want to access to get some more information about Horizon. You can look at the source code of our coordinator uh, demo. Uh, and we also have some webinars uh, when we talk a bit more about the development tools and so on. Thank you for your time, and we still have time for the Q&A chat.